Uh, and as Eric said, I've been at Risen Life since 2012, and I've held every position there, I think, but I became the senior pastor um, just in February. Um, I've been in Utah since 1996, and I always say I came out here for spiritual reasons, for climbing and skiing, and uh, met my, my wife here, and we've been married for 22 years this month, and we have four, four kids, and so I'm excited to be with you guys. All right, we're going to talk about the book of Isaiah today, and uh, I called it a pathway to transformation, and we'll talk about what that means in a second, but I, I love this book. I don't think I initially liked this book. You know, the first few times you read it, you're kind of like, what is going on here? Right? It's long. It's confusing. Um, but it actually is really coherent and has really cool things to say to us. And I think particularly um, it tells us how God transforms us from people that don't follow him to people that are his. Right, and so that's what we want to we want to bring out today, um, and so um, yeah, I like to refer to the Book of Isaiah a lot in my preaching. I think the church gets a little annoyed at me sometimes because I I kind of I kind of always default back to there. Uh, in fact, I would say if you had one book of the Bible to hold on to, this would be the one I would choose. And uh, I, I'd, I'd say that because Isaiah re reviews what God has done up to that point, right? So he, he talks about Moses and Noah and Adam, and he talks about all these things. He tells the people of God what's going on right then and there, and then he looks forward to everything that's gonna, that God is going to do through Jesus and beyond. I mean, he's talking about things that haven't even happened yet, and so... Uh, I like to say it's what the gospel writers footnote. So if you're looking for their source, it's Isaiah, right? And so that's is part of why this is such an uh, important book for us. And I also think it just it helps us to know God better, and we just get such a vivid illustration of the gospel through a lot of the things that transpire there. In fact, that's what you know the New Testament tells us is that the Old Testament... Um, through these living events that happen is giving us illustrations of these gospel principles, right, that happen to the people of Israel. All right, uh, as we start, you know, I, I have these two pictures up here underneath. Does anybody know what these are? Has anybody ever seen these before? Seals. Seals, okay. All right. So these are what they're called bulla or bulle, however you want to say it. Uh, which are seals, as Eric is saying. So like somebody would write a letter, and then you put this little piece of clay on there, and you'd press your ring into it so that they would know that it's yours, right? Be official. Or send a present, maybe something in a bag, and then it would have a string, and this would be um, put on there. So somebody would have a ring that has this impression that says that it is theirs. So this one on the left is actually my favorite, even though that one's pretty cool too. Um, but this one is what's called the King Hezekiah Bulle. So it was found in 2009 in an ancient refuge, refuge or trash dump outside the Temple Mount. And in fact, um, so archaeologists got to dig through this and they found 30 or 40 of these in this trash dump. Um, but the interesting thing on it is that this inscription is Paleo-Hebrew, so that's kind of ancient Hebrew before it turned into the block script. Um, it says, belonging to Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah. So this is pretty cool. This means either this came from his ring or one of his official scribes, right, that could, that could speak for him. Um, and, and this one is very well attested by scholars that this is of Hezekiah, right? And so um, the other one... This one's a little more controversial. It was found in the same trash pile, uh, about 10 feet apart, um, and it uh, reads, belonging to Isaiah the prophet. Okay, and so this one, they debate if that's what it actually says. If you can see here on the, on the seal, they've added a letter on the end, those dotted letters. They think that's the letter that's supposed to be there. So either it could be saying, belonging to Isaiah, son of... And somebody's last, you know, somebody's father, meaning kind of their last name. 
or it actually says of the prophet Isaiah. So that's where that one is debated and we're not sure, but uh, it's at least cool um, that it's a possibility, right? But the Hezekiah one is well attested. And I, and I put these things up here because when you come to the book of Isaiah, it's talking about real things that happened. Okay, I mean, this is, this is real history. Um, and Isaiah is giving us a theological eye to that, what God is doing in this history. But this, you know, the kings of Israel are really well attested. Um, in ancient literature, both in Assyria and Egypt and other places, and then things like this. There's also, has anybody ever been to Israel? Okay, did you go through Hezekiah's tunnel? Okay, so this is something in the book of Isaiah or in the book of Kings that Hezekiah built for some of the wars that were going on to bring water to the city. So you can go there and go through the tunnel that he, that he built. Um, there are other things in Assyria that talk about how Sennacherib, king of Assyria, had Hezekiah hemmed up like a bird in a cage. This is, there's a prism um, that has that written on it and, and other things. And so when we approach the book of Isaiah, we're talking about very real history. And there are good things to um, attest to that, and, and I like these. Um, you know, it's interesting here that many have debated what does this symbol mean for Hezekiah because there are other things from Hezekiah that show like an Egyptian scarab beetle. I don't know if you've seen that. And, and so that's kind of an Egyptian symbol. These are Egyptian symbols on either side of this winged sun, um, meaning life, right? And, and we know that um, Israel had an affinity for Egypt at that time and looked to them for some of their help. But some have said this is a really unique symbol um, and that the sun is representing God uh, and his trust in God. And then the downward turned wings as being a sign of humility. That maybe this was post his experience with God saving him and humbling him through sickness, as Isaiah talks about. And so it is speaking of that. And possibly even, uh, if you know uh, Isaiah and Hezekiah, um, one of the things that God did for Hezekiah is really sick and God said he was going to save him. And he also told him that uh, I'm going to give you a sign and the sun is going to march back a couple steps. Some have said maybe this is even referring to a sundial here about what God did to save him. Again, those are controversial. What it says that it belongs to Hezekiah is well attested and, and people agree. So, um, All right. As we talk about the book of Isaiah... Um, it's always important to talk about authorship for just a moment. And in fact, me and Eric were talking about this this morning. Um, but if you read commentaries or literature on Isaiah, you'll quickly see that there is a lot of people that will say that the whole book wasn't written by Isaiah the prophet. Okay, they'll say there'll be one, two, three, maybe even four. Um, there's even some people attest up to eight different people that uh, at different time periods, put this book together. And this is really, um, there's a thing called critical scholarship. This is really started with the enlightenment ideal that everything is naturalistic, there's no God, right? And there's no way anybody could know prophecy. And so they look at prophecy in the book of Isaiah and they'll say there's no way there could be a guy that was talking about things 150 years into the future and know what he's talking about. Obviously, that was written later and then added to the book, okay? So this is kind of the, the general argument. But I want to just give you six quick things for believing in one author being Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, the seventh uh, century prophet. So first one, this has been the traditional understanding of the vast majority of Jews and Christians throughout all of history. Okay, this idea didn't even come about until the 1700s and the 1800s. Okay, to just to give you an idea, Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, right? Isaiah lived in 706 and 700 BC. Um, so we're talking two and three thousand years later. Did this idea pop up? Okay. Secondly, the book itself claims to be it presents itself to us as having one author, right? So if you look at, there's three introductions in the book of Isaiah. 1-1 says, the visions of Isaiah, the son of Amoz. 
chapter 2, 1 says the word that, they, that Isaiah the son of Amos saw. And 13, 1 says the oracle concerning Babylon which Isaiah the son of Amos saw. There's no other attestation in the book for any sort of other authorship, right? It, it claims this is how it presents itself to us. Um, by the way, there's also corresponding conclusions, which I think are interesting. 48, 22, 57, 21, 66, 24. They all say there's no peace for the wicked. So you kind of have these three introductions and three conclusions. The last one is a picture of no peace for the wicked. Um, also, I think this one is really important. The quotes of Isaiah in the New Testament are always credited to one author. Okay? So if we're going to throw out Isaiah, you've got to throw out the rest of the Bible, pretty much. Um, particularly, Jesus, in Mark 7, he refers to what Isaiah said. He says, as the prophet Isaiah said, and then he gives a quote from the book of Isaiah. Okay? So this is, this is the understanding of Jesus, the understanding of all the New Testament writers. Um, and this is a really cool thing. I want you to see this. So if you look at the index of the Nestle Allen 28 edition of the Greek New Testament, and, and Eric has one of those out there, the New Testament cites or alludes to all but three of Isaiah's 66 chapters. That's how important this book is, okay? Amounting to 637 allusions to and citations from Isaiah by the apostles. They thought this was an important book, and they thought it was all from one guy, and they quoted from almost every chapter. Pretty cool, I think. Okay. Um, number four there, there's no textual evidence, There's meaning there's no manuscripts that, that demonstrate that there's more than one author. So every copy of the book of Isaiah we have, it's shown as one book, right? In fact, uh, you know, you've learned some about Qumran scrolls here, uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, there was two complete copies of Isaiah found there, which is amazing. The one, the one, the great Isaiah scroll is by far, I mean, it's a, it's a masterpiece of preserved scripture. Um, and it's one book, just like we have it. In fact, it varies very little. It varied about 5% from the Masoretic text of the, the Jewish scriptures from 1000 AD and the Qumran scrolls from like 150 BC, okay? So we have a, a, a direct line, 150, 1000, all the way to our Bible today, the same. There's about 21 Isaiah texts that were found in the cave of Qumran and five commentaries on the book of Isaiah, not one of them speaks to it as if it was more than one author, right? All of them show one author, one text. Um, also, there's similar themes of vocabulary found throughout the book. Um, you'll see that, you know, one, one uh, John Oswald, who's a great scholar on Isaiah, I love his commentaries on Isaiah, uh, he says Isaiah is like a modern symphony with, with themes appearing and reappearing in fascinating harmony. Not only is this true of the themes, but also a number of figures of speech, trees, highways, banners and standards, deserts, gardens, fertile fields, children, light, and darkness. Like these themes run throughout the whole thing and they pop up at different places throughout the whole book. Again, I think pointing to the, to the work of one, one man. And then I've added this one because I think this one is really important. I think Isaiah, the book of Isaiah itself requires or it necessitates um, the supernatural reading of Isaiah, okay? So meaning, um, if, if you're going to read Isaiah as truth, it requires that you believe that God could have spoke through one man and given very distinct um, prophecy. And so this is the verse I would point you to. In fact, the, the, the God of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, is claiming this about himself. This is Isaiah 48, uh, 3 through 5. It says, The former things I declared of old, they went out from my mouth, I announced them, and suddenly I did them, and they came to pass. Because I know you are an obstinate, and your neck is an iron sinew, and your forehead's brass, I declared to them, to you from old, before they came to pass, I announced them, 
lest you should say my idol did them and my carved image did them. So what God is saying is, in this section in the 40s of Isaiah, he's basically arguing there's only one God, and I'll tell you how I'm God, because I told you things that would happen before they ever came to pass. And so if you want to reject the prophecy of Isaiah, then you have to throw out the whole thing in God himself, right? Because this is what God is claiming about himself, that he can speak of things yet to come and then bring them about. So there's a supernatural necessity, I think, for one author of the book. Okay. We're going to clip along here because I want to get to, to the actual the transformation part. So uh, historical setting, okay? If we look at Isaiah 1.1, it sets out the context of our book and, and history. Um, Isaiah 1.1, right? It says, The vision of the son of Amoz, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. All well attested in ancient Near Eastern literature as well. Um, but this gives us the time period of when Isaiah is writing the book. Okay? I mean, don't you wish all biblical books give you this right at the beginning? But Isaiah does. He tells you when I'm writing this in the days of these kings. And so as we work out our timeline of when that happened, that's roughly 740 to 686 BC. Okay, so about 60 years-ish there. And what we'll see when you, when you look at the book of Isaiah, really the first 39 chapters are talking about this time period, the 8th and the 7th century BC where Assyria is the main threat. And then Isaiah 40 through 66 is where he's speaking 150 years into the future beyond his lifetime about what God is going to do in the mid to late 6th century or the 500s B.C. So he's speaking about to those that are in the Babylonian captivity. Okay, and that's beyond his lifetime, 150 years into the future. Okay. Um, all right, so we'll keep that in mind as we go. Here's kind of a quick timeline of the major things in the book of Isaiah that are good to know when you're reading it. So Isaiah's call, you know, in the year, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, right? That's 740 B.C. Uh, that's from Isaiah 6. This Syrio-Ephraimite war, we'll talk about that in a moment, but this happens at 734, 732. That's Isaiah 7 and 8. 722 is when northern Israel is wiped out by Assyria. Um, 701 is when Assyria comes down and destroys all of Israel, really except for Jerusalem. And that's where God comes out and destroys them by sending out the angel that kills their whole army. 687 is when Hezekiah's reign ends and Isaiah likely dies shortly thereafter. Um, Sennacherib's death, that's the king of Assyria, He's a, he goes back with his tail between his legs to Assyria and gets killed uh, in Nineveh as people take the kingdom from him. And then it's going to talk about the Babylonians' destruction of Jerusalem in 586 and Israel's return from Babylon in 539. That's, that's the time period that Isaiah is dealing with, okay, what he's speaking to. Again, he only lived through about 687, but 40 through 66, he's looking into the future. Okay, about what, what God is going to do. All right, here's a brief outline. Um, it's, you know, th there are large outlines for Isaiah, right? Very detailed outlines. But this is a good, just brief one, right? Really, 1 through 39 are about condemnation of Israel and their sin. Uh, 40 through 66 are about comfort of the people. So we'll, we'll walk through all these different things there. If you want that outline, I can give it to you. Okay. All right, so let's get into this matter of transformation. So here's the big question that I think Isaiah is trying to answer. It's how can a sinful, corrupt people at this point, Israel, become the faithful servants of God? Okay, this is, this is the question that I think the book is wrestling with and trying to answer. How can this be? How can God take this sinful people and then transform them into, into faithful servant of God? Okay? And really, the, the answer on the biggest level is by gracious acts of salvation accomplished by God himself. 
That's what Isaiah is going to show us. What does that look like? Here's this pathway to transformation. Okay, It's through trusting God by way of an encounter with Him leading to repentance and the removal of sin and heart change brought about by the sacrifice of God's righteous servant for Israel. And these are kind of the different movements we see in the book of Isaiah. Okay? So trust in God by way of an encounter with Him leading to repentance and the removal of sin and heart change brought about by the sacrifice of God's righteous servant. And so we will uh, walk through the text here and show you this. Okay, so I hope you have your Bible because we're going to look at a lot of <coughs> um, Scripture here now. Um, all right, so open to Isaiah chapter 1. So first thing we got to do, first thing Isaiah is doing for us is he's showing us the problem. Okay, we got to understand the problem before we understand the solution. Just like when we become Christians, we got to understand our problem before God, before we can understand why the gospel is a solution. Okay, so here's what Isaiah 1, 1 through 6 says. We read verse 1, that's the historical setting. And now God is giving Isaiah the case against Israel. He says, Hear, O heavens, this is verse 2, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Ah, sinful nation. A people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. Why, do you be, why will you still be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head there is no soundness in it but bruises and sores and raw wounds, they are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. Okay, so what's he saying? What's he saying here? He's basically saying, verse 4 is the key. You, here's your sin. You've forsaken the Lord. You've despised the Holy One of Israel. You've, you've become utterly estranged. So God, right, is the one that brought Israel about. As he talks about in the book, he, he birthed Israel. He made them a people. He was their God. They made special covenants together to walk together. And he's saying, you've totally forsaken that and you don't follow me at all anymore. Okay? And um, this, is, this is not unlike, you know, what Adam and Eve did in the garden. It's just sin repeating himself. Or we take, it argues that we took God off the throne and put ourselves in his place and begin to do whatever we feel we should want to do. Right? This is our sin nature at work. This is the sin nature at work in Israel. Um, and, the, and the book will go on to say all the things that they did. And it's the regular list, right? They, they cheat for gain. They oppress the, the poor and the widows, right? There's rampant sexual immorality. Um, you know, all the things, right, are present in Israel. And God says this is not, should not be so. You know, here we also have this title that's really important for the book of Isaiah, the Holy One of Israel, right? It's the Holy One of Israel that's bringing this charge against them. Used 25 times in Isaiah. And again, it's highlighting God's holiness compared to Israel's sinfulness. But it also highlights His claim on them, right? The Holy One of Israel, right? This is their God. And so this is how Isaiah refers to God throughout. Uh, and verse 6 again tells us there this picture of them being completely sick with sin. They're like this, you know, person in a hospital bed that has bandages from head to foot. He's saying like, you are completely sick. There's nothing sound in you. And I think it also speaks to their inability. How are you going to get out of that situation, Israel? Right? This is what God's showing you. You're, you're sick. There's no way you're fixing this. Okay. So this is where they are. Idol worship, sexual immorality, depending on the nations instead of God, and the list goes on. 
Um, and this is really, I think, as we talk about the message of Isaiah, what he's saying to us. This is really the starting point of the gospel, right? To understand our position before God. When we run our own lives, God is not Lord of our life. Like, we're completely ridden with sin. And we're estranged from God. And there's no way we're getting out of that situation either. We're sick from head to toe, right? All right, now let's look at the next kind of motion in this pathway. Uh, yeah, so they're completely sick. All right, next part. Next, God now has an invitation to redemption and transformation. So Isaiah 1, 1, 18, one of the best verses, I think. So he lays out this case, and then he says this to the people of Israel. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. So God's invitation is, let's sit down and talk about this, Israel. Right? Let's figure this out. And in fact, you can be transformed. Right? Though you got red sins, they're going to become white as snow. Right? This is his invitation that redemption uh, is possible. And then the book gives us a really great picture of this. So in... Um, chapter 1, 27 through 21, it gives us this parable or this picture of the unfaithful city that becomes the faithful city. Okay, and, and really that's, this is what the whole book is looking at. It's going to go from unfaithful city to, at the end of the book, chapters in the 60s, it's going to show this faithful city. So let me just read you those verses. It says, How the faithful city has become a prostitute. She who was full of justice, righteousness lodged in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross, your best wine mixed with water. Your princes are rebels and companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe and runs after gifts. They do not bring justice to the fatherless, and the widow's cause does not come to them. So there's, there's their sin, right? It says, Therefore the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, I will get relief from my enemies and will avenge myself on my foes. So there he's calling Israel his enemy. Think about that, his special people. I will turn my hand against you, and I will smelt away your dross as with lye and remove all your alloy. <coughs> I will restore your judges as at the first, your counselors as at the beginning. Afterwards, you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. So here God's saying, I'm going to take this unfaithful city and I'm going to make it the faithful city. And this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to refine it. And then I'm going to give it really good teachers. And then it's going to become this faithful city. Okay? So this program starts to become more clear. And God is going to use the nations, as we see in Isaiah, to refine his, his people. Um, in fact... You know, in, in chapter 2 actually gives you even a little more. He talks about how one day this city is going to be the highest of all mountains where the house of the Lord will be established. And one day this city, everybody's going to stream to this restored Zion to learn about God. And they're going to teach people about God. So, again, we're going from unfaithful to gloriously faithful by God's hand. Okay? All right, now let's look at how God is going to do this. Um, refining work. As we said, he's going to use the nations. Let's see what I got here. Okay. He's going to use the nations, and as he said, he's going to bring judgment against Judah and Jerusalem, cause them to be destroyed because of their sin. Um, and in essence, they're getting ju the judgment their sins deserve, but it's in the service of refining them into who they need to be. Okay. Um, and this is going to come through the nations, primarily of Assyria and Babylon. So look at this, look at this image here in 526. Chapter 526, after again restating their sin, he says, I will raise a signal or a standard as I translate it. This is what I wrote my dissertation on. He'll raise a standard for nations far away. And he will whistle from them from the ends of the earth. And behold, quickly and speedily they come. And they're coming to destroy um, Israel. 
So I want to talk about this standard here for one second. Uh, this is used ten times in the book of Isaiah. In fact, this image transforms as the book goes, I think, again, signaling the transformation that God is doing. Uh, it's a short Hebrew word. It's two letters. It's an N and an S, right? That's unusual for Hebrew words to be two letters, but it's nace. And so what it's picturing is, um, these are, the, I'll explain these in a second, but it's picturing a pole, right, with a God on top. Okay, you can think of Moses when he makes the, the pole, the serpent in the wilderness. It talks about putting a pole and then building a bronze thing on top. This is called a nace or a standard. This is, this is ubiquitous in the A&E. Uh, in ancient Egypt, all their gods were displayed that way. Here's a, here's a god here on top of this pole, and he's overseeing this guy who's taking out this other guy, and he's happy about it, right? This god is empowering him to do it. This one over here I think is even cooler because it ties in with Isaiah. This is a picture of an Assyrian camp, and if you see these two standards here, um, they're representations of their gods that they took with them in battle. They were to symbolize the fact that their, their God's presence was with them. And this is an encampment outside of Jerusalem in Lachish uh, in the same campaign where Sennacherib's going to come against Israel. So there are their two gods that the priests are giving um, offerings to. And so again, these poles are thought of as bearing the presence of a God. So, so Egypt, Assyria, other ancient Near Eastern groups would line up their armies by God, right? They'd have this pole, and if you're under this God, you'd line up there. But it actually symbolized the presence of that God with their army, okay? And so here we have this interesting picture that God is saying, I'm going to raise my standard, and the nations are going to rally to it, and it's coming against you, Israel, okay? Just hold that in your mind for a second. Really interesting picture. All right, another feature of the book of Isaiah, when you read it, this is why our head spins a little bit, is his use of judgment and salvation. Okay, so you read one section of judgment, and then you get a section of hope. And, it, and I forget how many times it alternates this, but it's like 80-something times. And it almost makes your head spin. You're like, judgment, salvation, judgment, salvation, judgment. Which one is it? Right? Um... And it's really, for the prophets, you've got to see that judgment and salvation are really two sides of the same coin. God is judging, and yet he's, he's doing it in the service of salvation. Okay, this is like Jesus on the cross. God pours out his judgment on Jesus for all of our sins, but it accomplishes the greatest salvation that has ever been. Um, and so the effect of this is meant to be uh, performative, like... It wants to create a, a sense uh, of in the people where they want to have their hearts and minds move towards God. Like they, when you go back and forth, judgment, salvation, judgment, salvation, it's like, okay, I want to accept what you got, God. Right? I want to hope in you. It's meant to move them towards repentance and faith. All right. Let's keep going in our pathway of transformation. So God's invitation to redemption, he's going to do it through judgment uh, of the nations. Let's see. All right. Now, Isaiah also gives us examples of what it looks like to be transformed by God. Okay? Um, and so let's look at a few of those. When you come to Isaiah 6 through 9 um, in the book of Isaiah, this is one of two narrative sections. So the rest is poetry or, or something similar. Um, but Isaiah 6 through 9 is narrative, as well as Isaiah 36 through 39. And it's the story of 6 through 9 is Isaiah's um, transformation and call, and Ahaz a king. And then 36 through 39 is about Hezekiah the king. And this is a special place in the book. What it's wanting to show you is, number one, what it looks like to be transformed by God. And as and I almost said it the British way, Isaiah's... Um, Isaiah's life, but then he's going to show you the example of a king of Israel, Ahaz, who doesn't trust God, contrasted with King Hezekiah, who does trust God. And he's saying, you need to be like this guy, right? So let's look at this for one second here. So, let's see. 
Okay. Isaiah 6, 1 through 7. So here's his example of his own transformation in his life. 6 1 says, In the year, and you guys know this passage well, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Okay, so here's his encounter with God. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, and two, he, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And he said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to, him, to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Okay, this is Isaiah's transformation. He's letting you know what this looks like, right? He encounters God. He sees the distance between God's holiness and his sinfulness. He repents, I am unclean, I am thoroughly sinful, and God heals him and atones for his sins. Right? Nothing Isaiah could have done, God, God did it. And then he goes on to be called by God to be his prophet. Then what follows after this is he's going to give you now an object lesson number one. King Ahaz, no trust. Okay? So here is, in chapters 7 through 9, um, he's talking about King Ahaz and the Syrio ephraimite conflict that we mentioned earlier of 734-732. Basically, if you read those chapters, it says, Israel and Ahaz was worried about the fact that Syria, not Assyria, Syria, meaning Damascus, and northern Israel were teaming up to rebel against Assyria who was coming down, and they wanted Judah to join them to make their army stronger. But Ahaz was scared to do it, because Assyria is a really mean dog, and you don't want to play with them. And so what he does instead is God, God comes to him, as we'll see, and says, hey, I'll make you this deal. Like, I'm going to save you, but you need to trust in me. And he says, no, thank you. Uh, and he decides to make a deal with Assyria instead. He just goes around. I'm not going to fight them. I'm just going to make a peace treaty with them, and then I'm going to pay them tribute. And Assyria comes down and wipes out Damascus and northern Israel eventually, but leaves Judah alone. Okay, um, And this is where we see Ahaz's um, lack of trust. So that's, that's the situation. Um, look at, look at um, Isaiah 7, 9. So basically... God comes down and says, I'll give you a sign, Ahaz. What sign do you want to know that I'm going to save you from Assyria? And he says, well, you know, his prideful piousness. Well, I couldn't test God, right? See this in chapter 7, and God says, you're being, you're being silly, Ahaz. Like, I'm giving you a valid thing here. And he says, I'm going to give you a sign anyway. And this is where we get the sign of Emmanuel, right? That God will be with you. You're going to have a son, and you're going to name his name Emmanuel, and you'll know... When you have that son, that these two kingdoms are going to go away. And so there, uh, likely Ahaz had a son named Emmanuel, right? Um, because the prophecy is usually has a small fulfillment, and this would have been for Ahaz. And yet we know that this was also a prophecy of the Emmanuel to come. Um, and here's what, here's what uh, Isaiah says to Ahaz in 7.9. This is how we see the example. He says, if you're not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. Okay, so if you don't trust God, you're not going to make it, right? And this is the message they're trying to get. You've got to trust God to be transformed, okay? All right, let's see here. All right, so beyond that, Ahaz rejects it. He doesn't trust God. God still saves them. But then what he's going to tell them is, because you didn't trust in me, I'm bringing Assyria against you now, this bigger thing. Um, here's what he says in Isaiah 8, 6 through 8. He says, Because this people has refused the waters of Shiloah that flow gently and rejoice over Rezin, the son of Remaliah, that's the Damascus king, 
Therefore, behold, the Lord is bringing up against them the waters of the river, mighty and many, the king of Assyria and all his glory. And it will rise over all its channels and go over its banks, and it will sweep into Judah, and it will overflow and pass on, reaching even to the neck, and its outspread wings will fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. So basically he's saying, because you, re you refused my kind message and didn't trust in me, I'm going to refine you through the king of Assyria. And he's coming, and he's going to wipe out all of Judah and Jerusalem, except for Jerusalem. That's why it's saying, come right up to the neck. I'm going to come right up to the gates, right? And then I'm going to do something. And here's the answer. So what, how should they respond, right? 8.13. But the Lord of himself says, You shall honor him as holy. Let him be your fear and be your dread, and he will become a sanctuary, a stone of offense, a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and many should stall and fumble. Bind up the testimony, seal the teaching of my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. So basically, if you want to survive what Assyria is going to do, you ought to fear the Lord, you ought to follow Him, you ought to hope in Him, right? And, and will um, save you. So Ahaz is one of our object lessons on how not to follow God, okay? You need a transformation experience like Isaiah had. Ahaz could have had one. He was one of the wickedest kings of Israel. He refused to trust in God, okay? Uh, we'll skip that part. Yeah. In the, in the midst of this, you get some whispers of, of coming Messiah. I'm going to skip over those um, to get to some other things here. And in chapter 12, you get this song of trust in God. This is looking forward to now the transformed people. You know, one day, this is what they're going to say, like 12.2, it says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust. I will not be afraid. For the Lord is my strength. My song, he has become my salvation. This is where the people are going, God is saying. This is going to happen one day. All right. So now, again, um, God is going to use the nations to, to refine Israel, but he's not going to let the nations escape refinement either. Okay, and so chapters 13 through 23 Basically, Isaiah goes through every nation around Israel and talks about how God is going to bring judgment on them too for their sins. And that will lead them into even a bigger picture of worldwide judgment, an apocalyptic look, something that I think hasn't even happened completely here in Isaiah 24, 27, where he says God's going to refine the whole world one day, not just your neighbor's Israel. Um, notice 13, 17 through 19, chapter 13. This is where Israel or Isaiah is giving an oracle against Babylon. Um, and he says, On a bare hill, raise a standard, cry aloud to them, wave the hand for them to enter. Right? The nations are ga gathering together now to destroy Babylon. This is an example of one of these oracles of judgment. Again, here's God's standard representing him and who he is metaphorically, saying, I'm raising this standard, calling the nations, they're going to come and destroy Babylon. In fact, he's using Assyria as well to come and refine Israel. And he says um, that Assyria is doing this in their own pride. They think they're awesome. God is using that. But then God's going to judge them for having done it that way. Right? This is interesting. So don't discount. This says to me, don't discount world events. Right? Even if you don't agree with them, know that God sits over all of them and he'll use them as he pleases. Right? Um, all right. Again, the answer is Isaiah 26, 34, you keep him in perfect peace who trusts in you. This is what he wants Israel to do. Okay, let's look at our other object lesson here, King Hezekiah. So be transformed and trust in God. This is a king who does trust in God. Uh, 30 years later, he's now king. Ahaz is no longer king. He's his son. He's a really good king of Israel. He follows God. Assyria has finally decided we've had enough of Israel, um, and so we're going to come in and destroy them completely. In fact, Hezekiah said at one point, I'm not paying you any more money, Sennacherib. Uh, I'm going to refuse to pay you any more. This is in 701. Uh, you can see it also recounted in 2 Kings. 
Um, but in the same place that Isaiah had the conversation with Ahaz, he has the same conversation with Hezekiah, right? You can trust God in this or not. What are you going to do? And so what we see is that Hezekiah listens to all the jabber of the guys from Assyria and how they're going to take him out. He goes and prays before the Lord and asks the Lord to protect them and be with them. And that's what God does. God comes in as Assyria comes up to the neck of Jerusalem, all of its troops, and in the middle of the night it says an angel of the Lord went out and destroyed all of Assyria's forces. And then it tells us how then Sennacherib, king of Assyria, goes back and he gets killed worshiping his idol by some of his relatives in his own town in Nineveh. Right? And so God completely wipes him out, and it's because of Hezekiah's trust. This is how he's saved. He trusts God. Um, then Hezekiah invites people from Babylon, and we learn that uh, God is going to take Israel into a Babylonian exile. And that's kind of where we end at chapter 39 of Isaiah. And so what Isaiah has, again, let's just review for a second before we look at the, the last part. He said, you need an encounter of God. You're completely sinful. Right? Isaiah has shown us that, what it looks like in his life. Then he shows us how it's worked out in these different kings. Some will refuse their encounter of God. Some will trust in their encounter of God. And they will trust in him and they'll be saved. Okay? This is what, what the book is pushing us to. You need to be like King Hezekiah. Right? Don't be like Ahaz. Learn to trust God and be saved. And so at chapter 39, we fast forward 150 years into the future. The first book has been all judgment and what God is doing to refine Israel. Um, 40 through 66 now is going to be about God's salvation of Israel, how he's going to bring the people out of Babylon and he's going to save them. Okay. So this is salvation and sin accomplished by God's suffering servant. So this, this whole section is about salvation and how God is going to accomplish that in their lives. So chapter 40, you know, I don't know, does anybody ever go listen to the Messiah sing in? It, it sings a lot of this story, which I think is really cool, but it sings always, chapter 40, it sings, right, comfort, comfort my people, right? Um, so 40 verse 1 says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Right? And so it's saying, I have refined you. It's over. Right? You, you've received what you deserved, and yet now you're going to be saved. Right? And so it begins to go through, and God talks about how he's going to do this. And the, the surprising thing, let's see if I can find it. Um, the surprising thing is this coming of this servant that is going to be God's man to save Israel. Okay? So look at chapter 42. We're going to read each one of these. There's what we call four servant songs and in all of these are because it talks about my servant will do this that Isaiah reveals to us and the first one is in chapter 42 verses 1 through 9 and I'll just read it because they're so good it says behold my servant whom I uphold my chosen in whom my soul delights I have put my spirit upon him and he will bring forth justice to the nations he will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street a bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged until he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says God, the Lord who created heavens and stretched out the earth, and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people of it and the spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I've called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, for the prison that those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things 
I now declare before they spring up, I tell you of them. So what God is saying here is he's doing something like I've never done before with you, Israel. Something you've never seen before, right? Because they, they tend to look at their history and interpret what God's doing by what God has done in the past. And you say, look it, I'm doing something brand new. And I'm doing it through this servant, this special guy. So he's doing a new thing. The servant himself, it says, will be the covenant for the people. That's significant. Okay. And it says he will bring the restoration and healing. He's going to one, he's going to be the one that brings them out of the darkness and brings about this healing. God is doing the work, but he's doing it through this servant. That's what he's telling us here. And then it goes on to argue in some of these low chapter 40s that God is Israel's savior, okay? So again, it's saying um, that he is the one that is saving them, but he's doing it through this servant. And because it's such a new and crazy thing, he gives us four pictures of it, I think. Um, here's the second servant song, Isaiah 49, 1 through 13. It says, Listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb. From the body of my mother, he named me by name. He made my mouth like a sharp sword in the shadow of his hand. He hid me. He made me a polished arrow in his quiver. He hid me away. And he said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing in vanity. Yet surely my right is with the Lord and my recompense with my God. And now the Lord said, He who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, Is it too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel? I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, the Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the servant of rulers, Kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. Uh, thus says the Lord, in a time of favor I have answered you, in a day of salvation I have helped you, I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people to establish the land, to apportion the heritages, saying to the prisoners, come out, to those in darkness, appear, those shall feed along the ways on all bare heights shall there be their pasture. There shall not hunger or thirst, neither scorching wind nor sun shall strike them, for he has pity on those he will lead, and by springs of water he will guide them. I will make all my mountains a road, my highways shall be raised up. Behold, these shall come from afar, and behold, these from the north and from the west, and these from the land of the sea. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exalt, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing. For the Lord has comforted His people and have compassion on His afflicted. Okay, you hear all these things again. Not only will this servant bring back Israel, and He calls the servant Israel. He's the perfect Israel, the perfect son. He's going to bring back Israel. But He's also going to bring back the whole, all the nations to Israel and to God. Okay, a really beautiful picture. We get the third servant song here in Isaiah 54 through 11. Here's what that says. It says, The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught that I might know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as though those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheek to those who pull out my beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting, but the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Let him who walks in darkness and have no light trust in the name of the Lord and on his God. 
Behold, all you who kindle a fire, who equip yourselves with burning torches, walk by the light of your fire, by the torches that you have kindled. This you have from my hand. You shall lie down in torment. So here again, here it's talking about the servant is guiltless, right? He's saying, I am, I am guiltless. He's the perfect Israel. And those, he's urging us to trust in the Lord and to be sustained by him as he's sustained by him, okay? And then you hear all those echoes of the things that happened in the New Testament, right? People spitting on him, people pulling out his beard, people standing up and accusing him of wrongdoing even though he is guiltless, right? And this is how a God is saying, this is the new thing I'm going to do to make you my faithful servant, Israel. And then we get the one that's well known to us, Isaiah 52 here through 53, the fourth servant song. And this really is the high point of this new thing that God is doing, that if God is going to transform faithless Israel, the faithless city, to the faithful city, He's got to remove their sin like He did in Isaiah, right for Isaiah when He was at the altar and got the sin removed through the coals. And this servant song says it's through the servant that God pays for all the sins of Israel. Okay? We'll just read it. Quickly, let's see how we're doing. All right, we still got a little time. Uh, 52, 13, he says, look, again, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance in his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which has not been heard they understand. Who has believed what he's heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up like him before him, like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And as for one whom men hide their faces... He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, and upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and yet the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He was put to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted as righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities." Therefore I divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. So again, how is God going to do this? What's the pathway to transformation? Well, you've got to have an encounter with God. You've got to learn to trust Him. But you've got to have your sins taken care of by this servant. Right? That's what he's telling us. This is how Israel is going to get there. And when this happens, then they can become the faithful people that God wants them to be. And again, notice this is all a work of God. Right? This is the gracious and loving work of God that looks at His people that are so far from Him and says, I'm going to put a plan in place to get you back to me. Right? You're going to encounter me. I'm going to refine you. You're going to learn to trust me. And your sins are going to be taken away because of this servant of mine. Okay? Um, if you turn back, I just want to point something out I ran right past. Back in chapter 11, 
you know, it's pointing forward to begin to give us whispers of how this is going to work, but it, it gives us a picture, uh, in chapter 11, of this, the root of Jesse, so a son of David. Uh, 11.10, it says, In that day the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a standard for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire. And then it, on down in verse 12, it says, He will raise a standard for the nations and will assemble the banished of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah. And so here he personifies this standard, like we looked at, as this son of Jesse. So there's going to be this character, who later I think is revealed as the servant, who God is going to raise up, okay, like this God on a stick. Think about that for a second. And the nations will either run to him for salvation, people of Israel will run to him, or they'll be repelled by him. Okay, I think this is speaking of the cross, obviously, and John even puts that together for us when he talks about the, you know, the Son of Man must be raised up like the serpent in the wilderness. Isaiah, I think, is picking up on that here too, saying the Son of Man will be this standard, right? And when you take that and look at it, he's he's the one through which God is bringing judgment against the nations, but he is also the one that is raised up that the nations should be asked to rally to. Okay. Fast forward back to chapter 61. There's a possible fifth servant song here. It doesn't use the word servant, but they think it speaks about this servant of God again. Three verses, 61, 1 through 3. It says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to open the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all those who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil and gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Okay, so again, I think this speaks to the servant, what he's going to do. Now, let's just take, we got, what do we got? Two minutes here. Let's take just a quick glimpse at the future um, transform Zion and his citizens. So this is the fruit of the pathway, okay? Chapters 60 through 62 are the high point of Isaiah that show us this transformed people. They've encountered God. They've learned to trust Him. The servant has taken away their sins, and He is their righteous ruler. And I'll just read... Um, chapter 62, because I think this points to, gives us this picture of, of the transformed uh, people. He says, For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not be quiet, until her righteousness goes forth as brightness, and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness, and all the kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give you. You shall be a crown of beauty, the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall become, be called, My delight is in her, and you are a land that is married, for the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God rejoices over you. On your walls, Jerusalem, I have set watchmen all the day and all the night. They shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest and give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it a praise in the earth. The earth the Lord has sworn by his right hand and by his mighty arm, I will not again give you your grain to be food for your enemies. And foreigners shall not drink your wine, for you have labored. But those who garner it shall eat and praise the Lord, and those who gather it shall drink it in the courts of my sanctuary. Go through, go through the gates. Prepare the way for the people. Build up, build up the highway. Clear it of stones. Lift a standard over the peoples. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him, and they shall be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and you shall be sought out a city not forsaken. 
right? So here's this glorious picture of redeemed Jerusalem, redeemed people that have gathered in this city that God has saved. And if you noticed in verse 10 when I read it, there's that standard, it pops up again. He's saying, lift up this standard over the peoples, right? So there's this image that I think the sun is being lifted up over this city. The people are participating in that. No longer are they his enemies, like when God raised the standard against them. They're participating in raising up the sun, the standard, and they are inviting people to come to the salvation that God has worked and to be a part of this transformed city. And so we see in the rest of the book um, a couple other pictures of that that we could read in chapters 65 and 66 um, along with some warnings. Um, but that's really the high point of the book. Here's this transformed people that have encountered God. They've learned to trust Him. They have been cleansed by the work of the servant and now the servant rules over them uh, with justice and righteousness. And really, that's God's invitation to us. Like what God worked out through the people of Israel, what he's picturing here, he offers us the same pathway, right? Like acknowledge your sin, know, see the difference, learn to, as we encounter God, learn to put our faith in him, and we do that through his servant that we now know was this coming Christ that accomplished salvation for us by atoning for our sins and now promises to us that all of us can join him in this new Jerusalem that he will bring down one day in the future. All right, just a quick couple things here. I'll give you these. These are books I like on Isaiah, if you're looking for ones to help you as you study and read the book. This is an introduction um, to Isaiah, Discovering Isaiah by Andrew Abernathy. Great little short book. Gives you a lot of things about the theology structure, etc. Um, probably the best commentary on Isaiah, I think, is this John Oswald. It's two volumes in the New International Commentary series. Maybe the best commentary ever I've ever read of all commentaries. Just his way of writing, his balance of scholarship and, and pastoral things, and just really, really good. Very devotional, too, at times. It's two volumes, actually. I mean, it's two books like this thick. Um, the short version is the same writer, John Oswald, in the NIVAC commentary there. It's only one volume if you want the short version. All the good stuff. Um, Paul Wagner, uh, his new one just came out in the Tyndale commentary series. He was my advisor for my PhD. Great commentary. I don't agree with him on everything, as I shouldn't. And then uh, this is a really great short one on Isaiah in the Bible Speaks Today series. It's about that thick, but a really good kind of devotional commentary on the book of Isaiah. I also like the older Nicot commentary by Edward Young. It's two volumes or three volumes um, as well as really good. So that's it. That was like a marathon and we, we got right to the end. So I know that was like a fire hose of information. <laughs> and we could have said more. That's the problem. All right. Questions? Yeah, questions. Yeah. So, uh, did Jewish teachers uh, teach that the servant is, is Israel? It's not Jesus, it's Israel. So, um, and Christian teachers would say that too. So, um, the Bible speaks of Israel as God's son and God's servant. Okay? So, you kind of you have to be careful when you're interpreting which servant and which son is he talking about. Is he talking about Israel the nation, or is he talking about the particular servant, this, this coming servant, right, that we would say is Jesus. Um, so that language goes all throughout Isaiah and in some of the other prophets. It can say Israel, or it could say servant, and it could be talking about particular Israel, particular servant being Jesus, or nation of Israel, nation, or servant being nation of Israel. So what, what the Bible presents to us is that Jesus is the perfect Israel, the perfect son, the perfect servant. Okay, um, Israel is God's son and Israel is God's servant, but they are marred with sin, right? Um, and so it speaks about it in both ways. They don't like Isaiah 53 and they don't have a good answer for it, right? Uh, Jewish scholars, they don't, they don't like the servant. They see the servant songs as messianic, but they would reject that it's actually Jesus that fulfilled those things. So they, they're just, they're just waiting on the Messiah. 
They're still waiting on the Messiah. What you got, Mark? It's interesting as you say that, that there's a cover-up because they uh, skip over 53. Yeah. Right? They just don't include They don't it. like it. Yeah. But then in reading in these chapters, you see in 49 and 52, at the end there, it's still you know, referring to, you can still get that glimpse of that. Yeah, no, there's four solid glimpses of who this guy's going to be, right? And really, like I said, kind of a fifth one there. Um, but yeah, they, they will skip over 53. They don't like it. Yep. Um, this might be a weird question, but um, it seems like, uh, I, I guess, what's a good way to understand 63 through 66? Because if you read 60 to 62, which was like the climax, yep. you think that verse 12, where it says, and they will call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and you will be called sought out, a city not forsaken. Why wouldn't it make sense maybe for the book to end there? Like, what is Isaiah doing when he adds 63, 66? It, kind of, it seems like an excursus, right? Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's, um, I'd have to look at my, uh, some of the deeper detailed outlines that'll give you a little more on that. Um, but it basically, again, it's this whole thing that Isaiah's got going of judgment and salvation. Right, so then we'll dip back into some judgment pieces. In fact, the book ends on a note of judgment, right? It says like, hey, the saints, of, basically the, the saints are going to go out and look on the dead bodies of those that God has, has judged. So it's this really like sobering picture. But it's part of that scheme of judgment, salvation, judgment, salvation to motivate you to go, I got to get, get right with God, right? Um, and so even in... Um, you know, I shut my Bible too early here. But um, even at the end of chapter 66, I, I would just say it's more of that. Um, and he's giving some parting concerns. And he's also giving some things beyond. Like that's where you get uh, chapter 65, the picture of the new heavens and new earth. So this seems to be something well beyond like a restored Zion. It's like, whoa, what's that about, right? And this is what Revelation picks up on, this kind of language. Um, so even in 66, he talks about the glory of this new city, but then also gives that picture of, of judgment. So I'd say it's a continuation of his kind of almost bipolar nature of judgment and salvation. Yeah. So I've noticed in this book too, Isaiah talks a lot about like supernatural events in nature. Like for yes. example, in 41, he talks about how I will make the rivers flow in verse 18. Uh, I'll make the rivers flow on barren heights and springs within the valleys. I'll turn the desert into pools of water and parched ground into springs. Yep. So my question for you is, are these prophecies of actual things that are to come, or do you think Isaiah is pointing to Christ as the living water? Good question. Um, <coughs> both. <laughs> the answer of a lot of these is both. And some of this is the nature of prophetic material. So, you know, if you talk about hermeneutics, um, genre is really important, okay? So when we talk about genre, that means like what kind of literature is it? Is it history? Is it biography? Is it poetry? Is it prophecy? Is it apocalyptic? Is it all these things? So we expect certain things from different genres. So if I read Harry Potter, I don't expect truth, right? I expect fantasy and enjoyment. I don't go to Harry Potter looking for a news report, right? If I read a textbook, I would assume, but I, you know, I hold 10% doubt, that, that it's giving me what should be factual and true information, right? So when I approach Isaiah, I got to know that it's, it's prophetic material, and it is very colorful, it's very metaphorical, right? It, it, it has all these pictures. Um, so when it's talking about, in chapter 41... Um, um, let's see, I'll turn the rivers, let's see. Um, I, I'd, say, I'd say it's both and, right? Because here's the other nature of prophecy. Prophecy always has like a local fulfillment, so we didn't get deep into this, but um, like when he says to Ahaz, you're going to have this, this there's going to be this kid named Emmanuel. Um, I would assume very likely there was a son born in that time who was named Emmanuel, who was very obviously the fulfillment of what God was saying to Ahaz that these nations are not going to kill you. Okay? However, prophecy spirals up as it goes. So it gets, each revolution, it gets bigger and bigger. That was like the initial curve. Well, we know the big curve is Jesus, right? 
So prophecies talks about something local usually that has very lots of meaning for the people right there at that moment. But it also has these iterations as it goes along and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so I would say um, there was probably instances when Israel came back from the Babylonian exile of the nation had been destroyed and the land had been destroyed and very much so God rejuvenated the actual land, made it fruitful and prosperous, and yet we know it also has a spiritual component to what Jesus is going to do, right? That, that we as dry souls will get living water and become new. But, but it has a, you know, you always have to think like the, the Old Testament in, in kind of big general terms gives us physical manifestations of what God is trying to teach us he's doing spiritually that he reveals to us in the New Testament. And so um, I'd say both and, yeah. That makes sense. That's a lot of thinking on prophecy. And... Um, thank you so much for this. This got me really going about Isaiah, that for sure. And, and it's one of my favorite books. But I, one of the things I was wondering, there seems to be a heavy emphasis in the book, too, that there's only one God. That there is no other, and yet there also. I wonder <clears throat> with with uh, the Jewish faith, there is also like say just from Isaiah nine uh, about the the son that he's going to be called the mighty God. Mm -hmm. So, is are there other things in the book of Isaiah that you would pinpoint that show not, the deity of Christ? Like you can yeah. Find so many passages that there's only one God. Um, I I think um, throughout those servant songs, as you heard them, probably one of the biggest things I point to is it says I, it keeps saying I have put my spirit on him and in him, right? So, um, as well as the language of my son and my servant, right? Um, so it, it speaks of this unique relationship that God has with this son um, who is, you know, son of uh, and servant of and has God's spirit in him and does the things that God does, um, as well as like what you pointed out there in, in, um, in chapter 9. So, you know, it speaks of him with God language um, throughout it in various ways. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, and, and, you know, this goes back to why do Christians believe in the Trinity? Well, because the Bible speaks like this. It speaks of this one as in divine terms, right? Um, and so it's not that we came up with the Trinity because we thought it was a really cool thing. It's us trying to wrestle with the Bible speaks about Jesus as being divine, um, and we're trying to put that together, right? that he is, he is part of this Godhead. Other thoughts, questions? I know that was like a fire hose, so go Sorry. ahead. These might be dumb questions. I'm LDS, but I'm trying to learn more yeah. about uh, mainstream Christianity. Um, so would, would uh, all these prophecies about Israel being a light on the hill and being redeemed, would these be things that happen... Uh, before Christ comes again, or are these prophecies about new heaven and new earth, or are, could these have been fulfilled uh, under like righteous kings like Hezekiah, or how are we to take all the prophecies about uh, Jesus' redemption of Israel? Yeah, so some of this will depend on your, um, um, your, uh, oh, I'm forgetting the term, your, um, some of it will depend on your theological framework. So if whether you lean more dispensational or you lean more covenantal, and I could explain those things if you want. But um, and, and some of it, again, I, I would say is both. Okay, so part of um, <clears throat> what God did here, so Hezekiah is a really good king, and yet he's you know on the short list before Israel gets destroyed. And so Israel gets sent to Babylonian exile, and then they are brought back, um, and so in some sense, Israel becomes this city that it's supposed to be, and yet it's always kind of lacking, right? It's like not as glorious as um, Isaiah describes it. Um, 
And so, uh, obviously, you know, I, I think what happens, in, in my opinion, um, the city, it's set, this becomes a spiritually fulfilled promise, okay? So when Jesus shows up, um, this now becomes like the most glorious city that's ever been. And all of us look to what happened there to learn about God, right? So that, that matches with some of these passages. I think it does look forward to a day, um, and we could talk about, you know, depending on your eschatology, I think there are passages that lean towards a millennium and, and talk about Jesus actually coming and ruling physically there in Jerusalem, and there may be a time where the nations are really looking to this city. Um, but on the flip side, I would also say, uh, in my own eschatology, in my own theology, um, I, I don't think the nation of Israel went away, but I do believe that we were added to it, and I'm forgetting the term for this. I would base this on Galatians. that says the true sons of Abraham are those that believe in faith. And so um, true, the true nation of Israel, you know, the true nation of Israel now is made up of those that are of Jewish descent but believe in Jesus, and the Gentiles that have been added to Israel who believe in Jesus, and they are now Israel. And one day they will dwell in this new Israel that's coming, new heavens and new earth. So, uh, again, this is a case of one of those, like, the spiral is getting bigger and bigger. And the ultimate one is at the end of Revelation, you know, 21, 20 through 22, I think, which matches with Isaiah 66 of this new heavens and new earth, which is, is in our mind, the heaven that is coming down. Um, and that is the grand fulfillment of this Zion that is God's Israel, right? Um, in the meantime, there is a spiritual Israel that people look to, right, to learn about God. Um, yeah, so there's a whole lot of theology and things to throw at you there. Thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Um, can I, can I so some of, some of it will depend on how you put together those things in the Bible, like I say. So some people will see a very physical fulfillment and that that's okay because uh, you know I don't think there's a there's one um, for sure answer on this and others will see a more spiritual fulfillment and I look more towards a spiritual fulfillment gotcha. so you wouldn't say there has to be like a kingdom in Israel as, as a necessary uh, fulfillment of it could be more of a spiritual all of you know the Christians yeah being I, a spiritual yes kingdom. I would I would call the new Israel is made up of both Jews that are believers in Jesus and Gentiles that are believers in Jesus. So if you're a believer in Jesus, you are part of Israel, right? But not necessarily the geopolitical nation of. Gotcha. Yeah. We could create lots of fights on that one. Can I do one more? And yeah, do one more. A little bit broader. Sorry, this is my last one. Yeah. Um, uh, Isaiah 6, 7, uh, I think it was Ezekiel, or no, I'm sorry, Hezekiah, that uh, had his iniquity taken away and that... Um, thing you were mentioning. That was Isaiah himself. Oh, Isaiah. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Um, do, do mainstream Christians see uh, the atonement of Jesus Christ uh, working retroactively, like backwards in time? Is that how Jesus, or how God is able to forgive sins pre the crucifixion? Or uh, does, does God have um, the ability to forgive sins uh, basically in spite of the atonement or before it happened? Um, yeah, this sorry, is. I know there's a broader. No, no, this is a good. That's a really great question for thinking about the Old Testament. I would say that that God has always forgiven sins in the Old Testament and the New Testament by grace through faith. So, what this is how that would work. So, in the Old Testament, people who took God at His word and believed Him and did the things that He had revealed. So, in this, in the case of the Old Testament, is the sacrificial system, etc were participating in images of the sacrifice of Christ to come. So as they did that in faith, they were truly forgiven, right? I mean, you can read that in Leviticus. You do this, you're forgiven, right? What God, on God's part, what he was doing, and, uh, and I'd have to find the verse, but he was basically storing all that up, okay? Like you just think he's putting their sins in a big bag, right? Until the time of Christ, and he places it all on Jesus, past and ones yet to come so that's the definitive moment in fact there's a verse that says he overlooked former sins so meaning they're doing these things in faith they have the experience of real forgiveness 
and they're participating in things by faith that are pointing to Jesus. So in, in that way, they're participating in what Christ does. And yet God's storing it all up for that moment in time when he deals with sin. Okay, and then retroactively, we as Christians, so God dealt with sin, past and future. When we as Christians be, say, hey, I confess Jesus is Lord, forgive me my sins, God then applies that forgiveness to us. So these things are these things happen in time, right? So like Old Testament Christians were given grace uh, as they believed in faith, and yet they were really forgiven at the cross. New Christ, you know, modern day Christians, um, as they believe God's promises in faith, when they confess Christ, that forgiveness that was made available at the cross is then applied to them in, in real time uh, at this point. So. I don't know if you'd have anything to add to that, Eric. Yeah. Thank you, I appreciate that. So I always say uh, it's consistent. Like we get in this trap to think like the Old Testament is, is something really different, but the mechanism of saving faith is the same. It's by grace through faith. It was a gracious thing that God gave the people the law so that they knew how to interact with him and had a way to deal with their sins. Yeah. But they had to do it in faith. And that's part of the reason God gets mad at them. You're just doing this to be doing it and think, you know, you think you can do these things and live totally contrary to me um, and that I'll bless you. That's not how this works. I was going to say there's a lot of scripture to support that too, but I, I really like Hebrews 11 talking about the Old Testament and the saints and the emphasis on faith. But one of the things that stands out there about Moses, you know, refusing to be called the, the son of Pharaoh's daughter and accepting that mistreatment. He says, it says in Hebrews 11, 20, he considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. It's kind of an interesting, interesting. connection, you know, in terms of what, what the faith reaching back or forward as, as you were saying. Uh, that just reminds me of something I say a lot, but I think this is important for the Old Testament. As I always say, the believers then knew more about Jesus than we think they did, but they know less about him than we do now. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So. The passage you were looking uh, for earlier, I'm trying to remember earlier, is Romans chapter 3. Yes. Begin in verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been uh, manifested apart from the law. Then you come down to verse 25, and it says, um, well, 24 and 25, we're justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. That's the verse I was thinking of, yep. Yeah. yeah. So that's pointing to this moment. This, this is the time when God dealt with sin, and in the past He passed over sins. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to derail the conversation. No, no, that's a great question. No, that's a good conversation. I think we're. That's it. That's it. We're at time. Jared, know how much we appreciate it. Thank you.